Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Poppett. I'm the Associate Director of the Illinois Heartland Library System, and we're thrilled to have you all join us here today um, to talk about summer reading in 2021. The good news is we're approaching summer reading in a much better space, a much happier space, a much hopeful space um, than we were when we met last year in this same grouping to discuss summer reading 2020. So we're all looking forward to it. We're delighted to have our colleagues, Ashley Stewart from the Caseyville Public Library and Lindsay Heron from the Wood River Public Library um, to lead us in the discussion of summer reading 2021. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I will be monitoring chat um, during their presentation. So when you have questions or comments, just pop them in there and we'll take it from there. We are going to ask everyone to please um, shut down your cameras and mute your mics so that we can spotlight our, spotlight our two presenters. Um, this event is a statewide event. We've opened the registration up to everyone um, with the cooperation of the Illinois Library Association. So we're thrilled. Again, I've said that three times, I can stop now. Um, but we are so happy that so many colleagues statewide have joined us. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Diane Foote, the Executive Director of the Illinois Library Association to bring you welcome remarks from ILA. Good morning, everybody. And Ellen, I'm thrilled that you're always so thrilled. You're very positive and that helps um, everything be better um, in these very um, unusual times. So welcome everybody. And thanks to all of you so much for pulling out your summer reading the way you did last year in an incredibly challenging circumstances uh, with some leadership from Ashley and Lindsay when they threw together a fantastic webinar last year about how to convert your summer reading and really creative ideas for ways to do it when our buildings were physically closed. So this year, uh, the we're, we're a little bit better um, off, hopefully, in terms of having our buildings be accessible to folks, but maybe not quite back to normal. So Lindsay and Ashley are here again with um, another set of um, fabulous ideas for us all anchored in uh, this upcoming year's summer reading theme, which in um, I Read is Reading Colors Your World, uh, giving a quick uh, heads up toward the future, looking ahead towards 2022. We have Read Beyond the Beaten Path and the recently announced theme for 2023, which is Voice, Find Your Voice. So we're really excited about I Read. We're really excited about summer reading. Uh, we're all here across the state of Illinois live today. And I just wanna point out that we've got some state partners well beyond us here in Illinois. We have formal partnerships with the state of Washington, the state of Iowa, Minnesota, California, and Alaska. And we are looking to add some more state partners next year. We are also uh, partnering with uh, worldwide uh, with the Department of Defense base library. So um, our influence here in Illinois uh, reaches well beyond our borders. And I'm so proud of everybody here in Illinois for, um, for this fantastic program. I see some folks in the audience here who are on, and have been part of the IREAD uh, committee. I see one of our, um, our former ambassadors for IREAD, Brandy Smith's here too. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to her as well as to the chair of um, Reading Colors Your World, who is Alexandra Annan from um, uh, the Homer Township Public Library. Uh, but I don't want to keep talking because really Ashley and Lindsay have the good stuff for today. Um, we're going to be sharing this webinar with our state partners. And so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead to uh, Lindsay and Ashley. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to start sharing the screen here. Hold on. There we go. Different share. Okay. How can everyone see that? Is that good? Lindsay, you good? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I'm Ashley Stewart. Um, I will give a little bit about me and I'm sure Lindsay can do the same just because it is the whole state. So um, Caseyville is a public library district and we serve our population is 4,772. We're under 5,000 5, and our operating budget this past year was 206,000. So um, I like to say that just because it doesn't really matter what your budget is or your population size, you can have a wonderful program. So I'll give Lindsay a chance to let people know what her population and her budget is. 
Uh, yeah, so Wood River is um, a population of about 10,000 and our budget is about 400,000. So we're about twice the size of um, Ashley. Um, and we have nine staff members, including myself, um, and programming is split between three of us. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. Um, I do have a full-time staff member who does programming. However, she splits her title with circulation as well. So um, we don't have a full-time person devoted strictly to programming. So we have to kind of work as a as a team here to make sure that all of our programming goes off without a hitch. Yes, and we have five staff members. <laughs> One of them is a co-op student at the high school. So we all wear multiple hats. We all are involved um, with the whole process. So small but mighty, but like I said, anybody, any size, anywhere, we promise you can have a successful and wonderful summer reading program. So there is our contact information. If you want to get a hold of us after the presentation, you're more than welcome to. And with that, topics that are covered are obviously I read, planning and marketing, activities, resources, Q&A. But don't worry because the slides and the video recording will be available after the presentation. There's tons of links embedded throughout the presentation, photos and links themselves. So you're really, your only rules are just to not worry and have a good time because you'll get all of this information after the fact, and then you can take as much time as you want and need to go back through and go through links and all of that good stuff. Okay. Lindsay, I'll have you take off. All right. So this obviously starts with our iRead, um, with iRead being the basis of everything. And we want to remind you too that even if you're not using the iRead theme, um, a lot of this is applicable to whatever theme you choose. Um, so you can see the links on there. You can get a hold of the iRead newsletter and make sure you follow them on Facebook and on Pinterest. Um, even though I'm not the marketing coordinator this year, I know that they still have a group on the Facebook page. So you can join it and share ideas, ask questions. So that way you make sure your program is the best that it can be. So don't hesitate for that one. Okay, so let's start planning. Your main questions, obviously, who? Who are you targeting? What audiences? What ages? What do your goals look like? Um, what we did last year is we just made all the same goals for adults and kids because with COVID and a lot of kids being home, it was really nice for the family to be involved and all work towards the same goals. And you can you know, moderate or you know, modify if it's like an adult theme goal or kids, but all in all, um, just having them do the same goal, we thought, we saw that families really enjoyed that. That's a, and that's a big thing too. I know this conversation has come up recently with, um, should I have the number of books or should we track days or should we track minutes? And my biggest advice is make it the same across the board. So if you're tracking books, then make it books. Your goals can change, but it makes it easier on your staff to be able to say, oh, you just logged the number of books you read this summer. Um, and consistency is key. So that way your support staff, because let's be real, if I'm not the one working the front desk most of the time, my support staff is, and they need to be able to explain this just as well as I can. So simplify those goals and it'll make it a lot easier on you. And I think for me, I'm gonna keep that same simplified goal moving forward during non-COVID time. Perfectly said, yes. <laughs> Another question is where? Where do you want to have your program? Do you want to do completely virtual? Do you want to try to do the hybrid method? So starting with like an RSVP system, or you can uh, maybe start with an outside event, but then stream it as well. Um, and then, or in person, again, it, is there a way you can do an open house event? It all depends on what the regulations are going to be and um, vaccination and, and all of that. But Start thinking about where and allow yourself to be flexible so you're not so stressed the day of. If something comes up, make it so maybe you have a backup plan or um, no need to stress yourself out over it. But um, having a where is obviously part of your planning. And then when. So when do you want to start your summer reading program and or end it? What we did last year that worked so well is again, because of COVID, there's some things that came from COVID that actually were a good thing, I believe, in the sense that our partnerships have grown and communication and all of that. So what we did last year is our library is next door to an elementary school. And I knew that the school would be doing a reverse parade to pass out summer packets for the school. And so the whole family, you know, all the families and kiddos were doing this reverse parade. So I contacted the principal and I said, hey, 
do you mind if we stand outside our building and pass out our summer reading program packets the same time that you do your summer packets? And it worked out so good. So I encourage you to reach out to your schools, but even if you start your program later, say in June or whenever you normally do it, think about having those packets ready to go and contact your schools, your vacation Bible school programs, anything like that, and see if you can coordinate with them when there is a distribution event. And then that way the library can be there and be passing out packets at the same time. Because it's sometimes hard to get those families and transportation can be an issue. So if you can work together and have that done, oh my gosh, it was amazing. And it was so neat to see the partnership and you know cheer them on and go through, get your library packets and then get your school packets. So I encourage you guys to think about that. And then how, how do you want people to participate in your program? What different activities and goals would you want to have? Um, methods, do you want people to turn in paper packets? Do you want them to do online like Beanstack? And we'll go through all of those in a couple of slides. And then think about how you want to structure your prizes. And again, we'll talk about the different options in a second. So now you're probably saying this is really overwhelming, right? Like how do you <laughs> decide which one is going to work for you? And so we have already made our decision here in Wood River to do most of it virtual. Um, and I will give you as we go through some of the deciding factors for our library. Um, but I will say if you're not, if you haven't decided, my biggest piece of advice is try and plan things that if you have to go from in person to virtual or back, that they can be easily transitioned. So if you are going to try in person and then you opt later at the last minute to do virtual, they can be like a make a take and make kind of thing. So some of the things that you want to consider are your are what Illinois mandates are going to be, but also your municipal mandates. Does your does your city require um, or are they limiting the number of people you can have together? Are they requiring a mask when the, maybe the state has no longer required a mask? Those are things to consider. Um, the space in your building. So if you're used to having a program that's shoulder to shoulder, it's probably not going to be smart to have an in-person program this year because you can't maintain that physical distance. Um, also, is there proper airflow? And I think that's something that I frequently forget about, but making sure that you're going to have enough airflow. If you're in a stuffy room in the back of the library, it might not be the best option this year. Um, and is this going to exceed any time restrictions you've already placed? I always stop and think about perception. So we're ready to maybe start a few of our in-person programs, but if they're going to be an hour long and I only have a 30 minute time limit in my building, that kind of conflicts and we don't want to do any of that. Um, also, if you opt for an outdoor, in-person, but outdoor, where are you going to go? Do you have a park that's easily accessible? How is your setup going to be? What are you going to do if it rains? What are you going to do if it rained the night before and now the, great, the ground is saturated? So these are all things that you need to consider as you continue to decide. Um, also think about your patrons in your community. Are they comfortable meeting in person and will they register? So we're opting for virtual. I know my patrons do not register for programs. We've never registered for programs. It's a drop in model for almost everything. But I know that some libraries register for everything. And if your patrons are used to it, then go on with your bad self and do it. It's totally on what you're comfortable with. Um, and then think about your staff. I know that we all have different um, ways that we're handling quarantining material. Here at my library, we check items in before quarantining so they get off a patron's account. We've talked with other libraries and they said their staff isn't comfortable handling the material before it's checked in or before it's quarantined. That's fine. Think about your staff. What are they comfortable with? Um, is it gonna add an unnecessary stress? For us, we haven't done much in person. So going from almost no programming to you know, right into it every day, a different something, that's a lot of stress. And again, we're a small library, so we all work together. It's a stress I wasn't ready to put on my staff and we're gonna slowly add in-person programming back starting in the fall. And then the last one is think about their comfortability level when it comes to technology. Do you have the resources? Are they gonna be able to put out a really exciting program um, using a virtual model? And if not, then maybe the old school packets are the path that you wanna take. So these are things that we've considered here in Wood River and whatever you do, if you wanna to go to the next one, I think, oh, maybe not, I don't think it's on this later. Um, but whatever you do, just choose it and go with it. And know you know your patrons better than anybody else. So mm -hmm. just be confident in your choices. Yes. Participation. So what are the different ways to participate? I know that obviously summer reading, the goal is to be reading. 
But we've also seen how COVID has had an effect on social emotional well-being and all of these other factors that it goes into reading. It goes into um, having a mind space that you can absorb all that information and have a good time and be motivated to do things. And so think of different ways to allow them to participate, still earn credit, but obviously still encourage reading. So um, for ours, we try to incorporate a, a variety of activities. So reading and writing, craft take and makes, um, completing activities or tasks. So that could be something, you know, local or, um, you know, one could be um, find this geocache at the library or something like that. Um, coordinate with schools and other programming, volunteering and service hours. So many kiddos are in need of volunteer and service hours because of National Junior Honor Society, National Honor Society, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, all of these different clubs and organizations where they need to get these hours in. And this past year has made it so hard for them to get those hours. Think about incorporating that with your summer reading program. If you know that there are certain badges that they can earn or just having those activities that they could come, if it's yard work, plan a yard work day that, that local kids can come and help out to, to start earning those hours. But different ways that kids can participate and adults, I should say. Um, over winter and with COVID, we had our local pantry was closed. So we held, we made the library a local donation drop-off site. So ways that they participate in our winter program was donating food, donating coats and scarves. Um, we're collecting personal hygiene products for the homeless, just different things like that. So um, they love to do that. And then it's also a way that they can participate. And then how to track and record. So reading logs, weekly challenges, we create bingo activity sheets that they can just mark off different activities that they do. And then earning badges, some like the virtual badges, some like buttons, stickers, whatever you think that your community will really enjoy and get excited about. Again, like Lindsay said, you know your community. So do what's best for you and your community and your staff. And then methods. So there's Google Forms, there's web-based platforms, which we'll get in next. And then um, you can even have a Facebook group that people can go on. It, it can be private. So anybody who is part of the summer reading program can only be in, you know, part of this group and then they can all share their challenges or progress along the way. So there's different ways that you can go about it. So here are some of the different web-based um, platforms that are out there. Uh, Beanstack is what my library uses, and I can't rave about it enough. Um, there's also Book Points, uh, Wandu Reader, and Read Squared. Um, and also, if that's out of your budget, because these can be pricey, Google Forms is free. And you can easily set it up where they can add, um, put their name in, what books they read, or how many minutes, how many pages, whatever it might be. And it can automatically send it to a an Excel sheet for you, which is fabulous. Um, and again, it's free. So you don't have to have a huge budget to make these things work and to do a virtual model um, successfully. And again, like it says below, a lot of these images are clickable. So after this presentation, take that time and go through and you can research different ones, um, figure out work, work, what works best for you. So then no internet no problem. We can make it work. You can still participate in our summer reading program, even if you don't have the internet. So plan the old school methods in during your planning period. So creating those packets, um, which could be logs, worksheets, puzzles, and then, like we said, coordinating and, and getting those distribution events ready to go. Um, if you don't have a school next to you, think about sending it to them that they can pass out or um, a local food pantry event, anything like that, where you can get those packets into those families' hands. And that's and a then, great time too to use your volunteers. When you're assembling yes. these packets or these, mm -hmm. uh, these craft pa packets, get your volunteers in. That's a great, easy way to, and then your staff isn't using their time and they can continue to help patrons. Exactly, stamp, yes. Staple packets, fold things, yes, absolutely. Partner with local lunch programs. Like we said before, Vacation Bible School will sometimes have a lunch program. We could set up for the summer reading program to have a lunch program, and that's another slide, but um, think about coordinating with that. Advertising with um, yard signs, banners, local marquees, we'll get into that with more advertising. But think about old school methods for the families that don't have that internet, where you can reach them and how you can contact them. And then also think of ways that you can expand your internet. We saw this with COVID. 
Think about extending your Wi-Fi coverage if you haven't already, maybe at the parking lot or on the library grounds. Um, provide a list of available Wi-Fi spots in town. Maybe um, the library, it's kind of restricted or for some reason the signal doesn't go very far. Even just providing a list of the different places in town that does have free Wi-Fi, that would help tremendously as well. And then um, mobile hotspots, some libraries have Chromebooks that you can check out. Um, think about adding some of those items to your collection if you have the budget too. And then there, there, I feel like there are still grants that are available to you know, see if there's ways that you can get hotspots or Chromebooks or iPads, anything like that in your library. So those are other ways that we can consider that. And then if you do host like a hybrid event or in-person event, just allowing families to come in and pat, like drop those off at those times, I always tell families, just do the old school methods and we'll make sure to get everything entered in for you. So whatever um, works for everybody. <laughs> then with, own it, people. Whatever you choose, own your choice. This is your library. And what works for you might not work for the library that's in the town next door. Um, I actually recently found out that um, a neighboring community when they opened back up after the initial COVID closure, they were at full service. They've allowed computers this whole time. They haven't shut back down except for when they had COVID exposure in their building. Um, and I had no idea, but she said, the director and I were talking, she said, we don't have that many people come in on a non-COVID time. She's like, and it's been even less. Now my library, that wouldn't have been an option. So mm -hmm. she knows her community, she knows her library and she chose what's best for that. But at the end of the day, you own it and you don't need to explain your choices to me or any other library because you know what to do in your community. So do it, do it with confidence, be bold. Yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so make sure that you have time to prep too. So we always take um, an, a good two or three hours worth of training with our staff um, before summer reading. And this is to thoroughly go over um, the goals, how to log, how to use Beanstack, um, all the questions that are gonna come up and give them time to practice. Um, we also really encourage all of our staff to participate so that they know how to operate our platform. Um, leave simplified instructions at the front desk or in an email um, so that your staff can reference it as needed. Um, use your website, email links, um, send out your newsletters, um, if you can include any sort of embedded hyperlinks, those are great as well. Um, we here, um, obviously we use Facebook on our website, but we also have Wowbrary, and that's a weekly newsletter for us. So we can add all that stuff in um, and people can see it on a regular basis. It comes out every Saturday for us. Um, like Ashley has said, coordinate with your existing program so that you can um, just piggyback off of it. You don't have to do as much work, smarter, not harder, right? Um, take time to build those packets. Have your support hours. Make sure that it works with what you guys are doing. Um, keep eyes on those social media accounts because uh, I can't tell you 10 o'clock messages I get. How do I get a library card? I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm in bed. Aren't you sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, make sure that you, and even if you have to kind of delegate each night, somebody else is monitoring it, let's make sure that you stay on that. That is a really easy, accessible way for our patrons to get a hold of us. Um, and get some standard responses. Again, these can be with your simplified instructions at the front desk. Um, and we've done that here too, whenever we reopened, um, when a patron calls and says, well, what are your hours? You know, we had everything listed for our staff to quickly reference. And then we had standard responses across the board. We didn't want to, I just want to take the thought process out of it. We want to make sure that they're readily prepared. Because again, I'm not the one at the front desk all the time, they are, so. Mm -hmm. Very true. And I also, I think I put the coordinating with the school and programs now um, in this one, because for example, Collinsville School District at their last board meeting are already talking about um, like latchkey programs, summer, like different um, summer programs, summer school. So your school boards are talking about that now. So that's another reason why including that in your prep period, start prepping now go to those local school board meetings, go to some of these other community meetings, see what Park and Rec is doing, but they're starting to plan that now, just like we are. So um, getting that incorporated with them and that whole cohesive services in your community, um, it's ideal and they welcome it. I, 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 I can't speak for everyone, but 
the majority of people in the community, <laughs> if they know that you're trying to work with them and you can like co-advertise and co-promote different programs, um, um, I encourage you to, to go to those local meetings. And a lot of them are Zoom now. So just hopping on a Zoom and listening to your school board meeting or whatever, um, it really helps in that planning process. You could also, sorry, total oh, no, on the fly it. thought. You no, could yeah. totally come up with some sort of video that's hyping up your summer reading program and email yeah. it to teachers at the school. So you don't have to necessarily take the time to go there. You maintain that distance if you're still in the hypersensitive, hyper aware safety portion of some of us aren't. Some of us are coaching gymnastics with eight kids every night, like I am. <laughs> um, math. Um, and so if you want to get into the schools, try emailing all the teachers. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that if you have one contact in that building, you can get in and see more of those teachers. I promise mm -hmm. you, it just takes one contact in the building to get you access. So try it. Yes, for sure. Um, so your key to everything, your library card, it's the best card that you have in your wallet. And so with your summer reading, encourage the residents to get a library card, encourage them to get one updated if it's out of um, date or expired. Um, consider offering e-cards. I know this was huge initially. I, again, you know your population if it, it goes well with them or if not, but um, consider offering it if you don't already, if you do feel like a lot of your residents will take advantage of it. So with that, that, that would be like, you don't have to leave the home. Here's an online application. And then you would just have access to like e-resources and whatnot. Um, perks is it increases your accessibility. It increases your attendance and your circulation stats. It promotes online resources and databases. So um, if you do decide to do this, come up with something clever like e-cards, e-libraries, your digital branch, um, whatever that you want for you. Me and my population, um, we get a handful that will do like a digital only card, but a lot of them um, at this point, since our doors are open, they'll just come in and get a regular library card anyway. But again, you know what your community is comfortable with doing. And, and if a lot of your community does have commu um, computer and internet access, then feel free to promote that as well. But definitely promote getting a library card. Again, working with schools and churches and other organizations, um, if you have a library card application, see if one, to include that with your packet, and then two, if they just want to have that available. Um, there's a senior group in town that meets that sometimes will put a library brochure and um, library card application out that they can pass out. So think about all the groups that are currently meeting in town and see if there's a way that you can promote getting a library card. Marketing. Yay. I love it. Shout it from the rooftop. Like I said, own it. Be proud. But I think that's how I live my life. It's just loud and proud. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so marketing. Uh, signs and banners inside your library. Obviously, that's a pretty easy one. We all do it. Um, if you've ever been to my library, our whole children's section is, I believe, nine five foot wide, seven foot tall windows with no um lines or anything between it. So I have been printing massive um, flyers and sticking them in the window to try and drum up more, more activities and get people in the doors because you drive by it and using Canva, which is highlighted in here, we can get such bright, bold things on those windows. Um, so use what you have. Um, yard signs are great, banners outside the library. Um, here in our town, there are two major intersections that have a fence. And so like the fire department, uh, we'll put up fish fry um, banners, same thing with when we do our ice cream social. So that's one thing that we're gonna work on as well as getting a big sign. So when you're stopped at that light, you can see that it's time for summer reading um, and hopefully we can get more, more interest as well. Um, see if you can get on marquees at other locations. If you have one at your library, clearly use that one. Um, if you're like me, you have no sign outside. So um, seeing if the school will put it out there, um, banks are a great place to go to, community centers. Um, try direct mailers as well. The water bill is a great place to try and get a, get on um, with some information. Sometimes you have to think about how many characters because you don't get unlimited space like Facebook gives you um, or bank inserts. So reach out to those local places and see if you can get information that way. Um, there's lots of tools to do it yourself. Like um, Ashley has pointed out, Canva is great. Um, also, if you use... Um, Publisher, that's another really easy one to use and you can save things as a JPEG um, or a PNG to make sure you can get things on social media. So 
highly recommend um, both of those. And then shout it virtually. So there's emails and newsletters and then social media. So in your email, take time to update your email list. That can be so easy to get behind on if you don't already have a system in place. Make sure that one, your library card application asks for emails and email newsletters and, and if they can subscribe. But then two, take the time to update those email lists. And then consider using MailChimp, Constant Contact. There's other programs. Um, and a reference that we've included at the end, always check with TechSoup. Before you purchase anything, um, being a nonprofit, TechSoup has discounts on a lot. It has discounts on Zoom. I can't even list them all. But before you do purchase anything, just check with them to see if there are any discounts. Um, and then ask local governments, partners, and sponsors to include it in their emails and their correspondence, especially if they decide to be a program partner. It's a perfect way for them, again, to just cross promote and then having it included in their newsletters and their emails. And, and put then it in your email footer too. In your signature, put them a reading yes. as well. Yes, your email signature footer, yes. And then um, social media, try to utilize other platforms. Try, like take time to explore these other platforms. If it's YouTube and TikTok, Snapchat, be, get fun with it and have fun. And um, it's always interesting to see who will start coming in your library, just trying to use a different platform or a different outreach method. And then use other features. So um, stories and news feeds and um, try engaging people by doing like surveys or um, polls, different things, different features that are already embedded in, into these different platforms. Try using some of these other features to see who you can pull in. Don't be afraid to post more frequently. Um, I think an advertising um, stat I heard is someone has to see it what six to seven times before it finally like sinks in and they remember it so don't don't feel bad to just start putting things more out out there and more frequently and um it takes a while for people to be like oh wait I, did, I think I did hear something about that and then make sure to tag your your partners and your sponsors so just putting at and then the name and then it'll tag them but then that way your posts will then reach all of their friends and anybody that's following those pages as well so um, tagging your different partners and sponsors and um, mainly those, but that it allows you to reach because you can always check in and add your location. I don't think that will really get to more people, but by tagging people and having other people in your posts, it will reach all of their contacts as well. And don't be afraid to pay for the sponsorship as well. It's yes. actually really affordable to use Facebook, like to pay for your sponsorship. And what's great is you can select like how far you're going. If yes. maybe if you're doing like, um, we once did like a cars for women kind of a thing, um, with the local auto body shop or repair yeah. shop and, uh, you can do it just to women. You can, uh, and it depends on how much you want to pay, but we, I think at most have paid like 10 or $12 for like a week's worth of sponsorship. Um, and it's, you'll see it. I'm sure you've seen them. They say sponsored underneath it and it shows up in, a, in people's news feeds. It's great. So I highly recommend paying for, for sponsorships as well, or even newspaper yes. ads too. I mean, we have a, a good number of older people who see events because of faith, because of the newspaper, which sounds mm -hmm. antiquated, but it still works. Yes, for sure. Prices. Right, so, yes. We love things, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> So think about, um, are there going to be like a level? So how are they going to, how are they going to get these prices, right? Um, is it for every five books they read, they get a prize? Is it just a grand prize? Um, here for us, our preschool kids, everybody gets a small prize. Um, sorry. Sorry. I get real excited and I don't know how to stand still. I'll try better, Lynn. Okay. Um, I know. Um, so for all of our preschool kids, they all get a prize. Then we're having one grand prize that we purchased from iRead, um, the plush uh, crayon that's super cute. Um, and then for K to five, we have three grand prizes and you put in for like a raffle. So you can earn entries using Beanstack or virtual tickets. So um, for basically kindergarten through adult, we do three prizes and you can just 
win one. But everybody gets invited to our finale party. So we want everyone to get something. It's just uh, how do you want to do it? Um, think about how they're going to get those prizes. Again, everyone's comfort level is different. Are you going to allow them curbside? Do you want to schedule a certain time at the end of summer reading? They can pick it up. Um, do you want to try electronic gift cards or mailing your gift cards? Um, or porch drop off. Obviously, some of these are going to depend on who participates. Uh, if you've used bean snacks, you've probably encountered Aaron Yang, who um, does not live local, <laughs> but he loves to participate. We had a group oh. of four people from New York. <laughs> and um, obviously, like we can't mail some of the bigger prizes, but a gift card could be mailed. So um, just think about how, like, who's participating. And if you're going to offer porch drop off, you might want to add the um, disclaimer that it's only within like your city limits. Um, other options too would be like paying it forward. So maybe instead of awarding individual prizes and adding to the clutter in some of our homes, um, if you have little humans at home like I do, I don't need more tchotchkes. So um, something that maybe is a group goal. Last year we worked towards a community reading goal and everybody got free ice cream. Um, I know, I think Painter suggested a coffee bar. Their adult mm. patrons got a coffee bar for a week. Um, you could do an ice cream Sunday bar. Probably not great with COVID, but thoughts for maybe the future. Um, you could also do uh, for every book that's read, maybe your friends group will donate a dollar to maybe um, an animal shelter. So things that maybe you can work towards as a as a group. Those are a great way to increase um, people's interest and um, even add your partnerships uh, to those who are in your community. And again, you want to make sure you hit up your local media outlets um, and use social media to promote any of these sort of prizes. Yes. And as adorable as the, like some of the I read prizes are, or just prizes that you find in general, I, again, can only speak for my community. A lot of them don't even come in to pick up the prizes. No. So think about your community and if they will actually come in and pick up the prizes, they are more excited just to have an activity to do than they are necessarily about what prize they win. So we're looking at this year still offering like the small giveaways and different levels. And again, getting sponsors involved because they like to put baskets together. Um, but just, you know, I am now looking at like a community goal. So, um, you know, let's work together and then see if we can have an outdoor sitting area or something that the whole community would benefit from but a lot of them just won't come in to pick up their prices. So um, yeah, you, again, just think of what works for you. <laughs> and um, I hate to think if people spend money on prices and then nobody comes to pick them up just because they're more interested in doing something than um, actually getting a prize anymore. So, okay, there we go. Summer meals at your library. Uh, again, schools are already starting to plan this. But then there's also other resources that are available if you do want to try to offer a lunch program with your summer reading program. So I read it did a great job of putting some together um, free lunch at the library a New York Times article kind of goes into depth with this. And then no kid hungry is another great resource, but if you click on that I program.org it will take you straight to the lunch at the library page and all these different resources are there on how you can do a, um, a lunch program at your library. And I don't believe uh, many of them cost. It's really just getting the manpower to put those lunches together. So obviously being a library where we only have in the summer four staff members because our co-op student will be graduated. Um, think about if that actually is gonna work and then you can set up the volunteers to help stuff bags and, and all of that good stuff. All right. So diversity and inclusivity, um, yes. things to consider um, are, again, your population, you know better than anybody else um, what you need. So you need to consider if you have a deaf community that might need an interpreter, um, translator, or if you have um, bilinguals and if you need a translator to be there, uh, visual impairment. So um, I recently have used YouTube to include closed captioning on videos um, I will say be very cautious of that. Um, if you're concerned about the accuracy of it, go back through and edit them um, to make sure that they are correct. 
because uh, I believe Wood River came out Wood Ruff when I did mine. <laughs> um, it's also because I'm from here and I just say Wood River as all one word. So make sure you check those things. Um, screen readers, special collections, library of things, things to help um, those who might need extra help. Um, having, like we said, an ASL interpreter, sensory activities, fidget toys, having those available for participants. Um, and having a visual schedule as well, including images of what, what might be going on, not just a list. Uh, we usually have a giant calendar on our wall during non-COVID times. So uh, being aware of what you, your community might need um, is, is key. And putting a disclaimer out there too on your Facebook events that say, if you need, it, need assistance yes. um, in some way, just contact us and we'll make sure it's here. But sometimes yes. uh, we don't know what we don't know. Um, and so that's been a learning curve here. And we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome, that we are providing what they need. So sometimes you just have to remind them that, let me know. I'll make sure that we're ready for you or for your child at story time. Exactly. And use what's already out there. So the library community is a sharing community. That's what we do. We're here to help people, not just in the community, but each other. And so this I don't even, Multoma County Library. But anyway, um, I linked their YouTube page and this is just one example, but they have all like chant, like playlists on their YouTube channel. So one is um, Spanish, a whole bunch of Spanish um, story times and closed caption and everything. They also have a playlist of Russian story times and there might be German, but if you have bigger libraries or more diverse libraries that have those staff on site that can provide those story times and everything's already ready, I would venture to say, if you reach out to them and say, do you mind if we share some of these YouTube channels or YouTube videos for our summer reading program? Um, it's silly to make you feel more stressed or feel like you have to do all of this extra work if it's already out there available for everyone. So um, don't hesitate to look at other libraries, YouTube pages, um, all of that. And if it's already available, see if, if you can just share it into your program. Uh, I will warn, be cautious of that um, because for IPLAR staff, if you want it to count as your passive program, you have to create your own video. Sharing somebody mm. else's video does not count towards your programming um, numbers. So just stop and think if you're like, I don't care, uh, if this is much easier than more power to you. But if you want to count that, you got to make sure. Same thing with um, if you make an activity like a craft video, if you share a YouTube video, that's not considered passive. If you, if your hands are doing it, that's passive. You created it. So just be cautious, but just be aware. Maybe talk to yeah. your director if that's, um, if that's something that they're worried about. So. Yeah. Okay, so another way to incorporate activities and different ideas for your summer reading program is picking out different um, ways of awareness and education. Um, so I thought of things that are colorful and rainbow. And so um, there's uh, neurodiversity and then there's pride. So June is pride month and I think there's more um, in following slides, but uh, think about incorporating some of these aspects in with your summer reading program. Again, doing some more sensory activities, just bringing education to it. And again, adults through kids. You can have um, a neurodiversity display for adults and a pride display for adults. You can also have a neurodiversity display for kids and a pride display for kids. So think about what else, um, again, that educational aspect and maybe pulling people in that you haven't yet, but incorporating that with your summer reading program, anything bright and colorful and beautiful. So with that, um, there we go. June is LGBTQ month. And so think about a drag queen story hour. Um, I have different links for different lists about ways to do awareness and reading recommendations and um, different organizations and programs you can promote. Uh, with your pride display, consider offering LGBTQ resources that are local to you. Think about, um, there's all different ways that we can do about it. Um, have a presenter coming in that, um, we have the autism center that's local. And so think about having someone from the autism center come in and do a presentation or a workshop or a fun activity. So uh, think about who's local with you and then using them with your educational activities. 
and this is another one with drag, like especially with drag queen story hour yeah. um know your community yes um, so that's something that i would love to be here but i also know that there would be some pushback so i'm i'm we have to determine when that would be the best time right so stopping and thinking about those things so just again know your community and you know what's the best and like so, Lindsay said it might not include your stats but you can always you know we're not offering it here but this library is so if you're yeah. you know if you have patrons that you know would love to attend certain events but you just aren't offering it yourself don't hesitate to reach out to those if you're not worried about the stats part of it don't yeah. hesitate to to you know recommend certain events that other neighboring libraries or community pro, you know i'm trying to think of what's close but like we have a willoughby farm we have the zoo we have if you know they're doing certain events as well feel free to promote those too so the other thing is pay attention to um pronouns and titles so um ashley has a great graphic on here instead of like muffins with moms or donuts with dad thinking about donuts donuts with grown-ups or muffins in the morning or you can be like lollipops with loved ones um <laughs> <laughs> being aware that not every family has the same traditional dynamic that um that is, that is a tradition right um and that goes especially with titles that goes to when you're even creating your registration if i we've started veering away from parent names and putting guardian because not everybody lives with their parents um but the guardian can get them a library card or register them for something. So being aware of even those pronouns is, or those titles is important as well. Um, and things like this, it just makes everybody feel in included and welcome. Um, things that we're always trying to do, right? Let them know that our doors are open and that we, we want them here. Yes. Caregiver, that's a, yeah, that's a good one too. Yes, yes. So partnerships, it takes a community, right? It takes a village, it takes a community. We cannot, being a library, our operating budget is 200 and something thousand. Our like summer reading budget is like maybe $2,000 at that. The only way we can do as much as what we do is with our partners. And so um, I encourage you to look at other partners and maybe you haven't even considered some of these, but schools and daycares, coordinating with them, even just when you schedule an event. So um, for us, pre-COVID, uh, we would have daycare a local daycare like walk groups of kids over and so we would purposely schedule you know a speaker or a presentation when we knew the daycare would be bringing all the kids over but when you have those partnerships you kind of know what to look for but schools public schools private schools homeschoolers reach out to them do a survey see what they would be interested in and and what would bring them into the library even if it's virtually Civic organizations, churches, like your vocational Bible schools, Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions Club, absolutely get involved with your civic organizations. Um, they love giving back to the community as much as we do. So definitely think about um, partnering with them. Local governments, cities, villages, townships, mm -hmm. parks, police, fire. Again, that is the best way to have the library be more visible in the community. And then you're more likely to it's you develop friendships to, I mean, you develop friendships and those relationships. And so um, getting involved in having those other um, local governments is, is very important. And then parks and recreation, think of other parks. So national parks, sports complexes, gyms, anybody can become a program partner. Um, so think about, we used, um, oh my gosh, Metro East, recreation district, or I can't remember, but <laughs> the term, but um, they do a lot of our local trails and um, like our bike paths and all of that. And so we were able to team up with them this past year. Nature institutes and conservation. So again, um, trails, community gardens, local businesses, restaurants, bakeries, ice cream, of course, but then also think of like t-shirt shops. They helped us with our t-shirts last year. Um, home improvement stores, if you need something for a garden or an outside sitting area or a different project that you wanna do. And then we even have a bus line company. So um, even if they can't like transport a whole bunch of people, um, just any of your local businesses, they want to get involved and they want to help as well. So I ideally, oh my gosh, it'd be fun if we could do trips somewhere, but, <laughs> but just think of all of your local companies and businesses and getting everyone involved. 
So I will give you um, one of the things we're doing here that goes along with partnerships and a social distance activity. Um, we are actually doing a citywide scavenger hunt this year. So I have enlisted um, a lot of our local departments. Um, we are, we're not a district, we're um, a city library. So we have police and fire, city hall, um, three of our parks, because there's like 17 in our small town. <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously the library and then we have i believe six or seven local businesses that are participating um and they're in our bean sack there's a clue that i have somehow managed to make rhyme um and when they go to this business there's a text code that they put in and then it gives them a badge for doing so um and then anyone who finishes will be entered to win a grand prize which my plan is to have an item representing all of those businesses in a basket so they get something that kind of again Give them that connection to that building and so my hope is that when they head down to Kristen's hair and they see the text code that maybe they might go in and buy some shampoo or schedule their hair appointment with her um or if they're at russell's corner cafe they might grab a cup of coffee since i'm already here right um or if they're out at the park they walk the trail so we've partnered with them for a great social distance activity so i'm hoping it goes off we'll see um, but activity packets are another great way to make sure that people aren't congregating and we're promoting that that safety. Virtual library tours, um, again, if you upload it to YouTube, uh, I talked about the stats for IPLAR, you can see how many views, which is great, but you can also uh, give a tour of your library, give some history. If you're coming up on a milestone birthday, um, what are you using to make a text code badge? Um, Beanstack. So I did it on Canva and then uh, you have to enter it into Beanstack for them to earn the badge. Um, also, I've been using QR codes with it. So when they see it, if someone not participating sees it, they can scan the QR code, take them to my website, then they can sign up. Um, so that way we might get non-library users involved when they see my sign out at the park or at Kristen Tay or whatever. Um, virtual story times, so doing them in, in your library, uh, nature cams, presentations. I think at this point, we're all getting to be experts on how to do these things. Um, now we just have to turn it into um summer reading theme so yes and i included this after our partners because uh last year we reached out to some of our local community partners and they made the video so um we yeah. had cahokia mounds um the local you know historical site they put the video together so i love seeing people in the community get involved so if you know someone at cahokia mounds or another park or um, having them do the videos and get involved they can do a tour of their facility they can do a story time there um, they can do a presentation or a workshop but um having them do stuff at their site that you then can share on your um facebook page and um youtube and and it's a shout out from them to your program and to your library, but it's also getting them involved and they love to do stuff like that. So it's um, been really also, hard for them to reach people right now. So, yes. Yeah. Well, and I included, um, there's a picture from Chatham library, uh, yes. which they have an, uh, I spy, which if you don't have all this stuff or a way to do that, I did mine on Canva and again, put it in my giant windows at the front of the library. So, um, these are great. I think Columbia has a flat top, display that they're using for an I spy currently. So that's another great way that you can get people outside your building to participate in something. Yes. Um, sorry, more about QR codes. I Googled yeah. create your own QR code and it walked me through it. Um, and then I could download the image and put it on my, my documents. And then you just take a picture with your camera phone and it takes you to a website, um, whatever you link it to. Um, activity packets that can be whatever you want so last summer we did packets that had um like a nature scavenger hunt so walk around your neighborhood what do you see um mazes which if you have the i read resource um it looks like it's just a box that the i read items are being held or the i spy items are in um but if you use the I read resource guide, it's got mazes and coloring sheets and word scrambles that you can just print and staple together. So mm -hmm. the activity packet can be whatever you want. Um, mm -hmm. And with this one being, it could be coloring sheets for adults and kids. It could be, you know, reading colors your world. So it could be yeah, really anything. Um, 
So now we're getting into programs. So we're merging in to different types of program or not programs, but activities and different things that you can do. So here are some other examples is doing the virtual field trips and hikes. So if it's your staff going somewhere to do something or having their staff do something, um, incorporating outdoor activities. So recreation, community gardens, story times in parks and story walks. Um, concerts, poetry slams, anything that could be outdoors. Think about um, what you could do. Arts and crafts, the take and makes and sidewalk chalk. But um, the photos are an example of our community garden. And so we had a Girl Scout come help us, but um, different ways that you can do activities over the summer and get kids involved. And then here's two examples that I found, but one is, you know, getting movement involved. So um, again, it won't include in your stats, but if you want to share videos of what someone else is already doing, but doing the story times with the stories, songs and stretches, and then um, think of about sustainability in your area too. So this one they partnered with, um, I see, but it was an annual neighborhood forest free tree program. So families are actually getting um, trees in honor of Earth Day. So the possibilities are endless in what you want to do and what you want to offer. And then um, this one is different like kids or things that I found that were kind of artsy. But again, all these photos are links to these other libraries and their pages. And we'll have a list of like, um, Facebook pages that we recommend that you follow. So that's where I got all of these, but you can do like little tiles or little canvases that people can do and, and take home it and make artwork with it. And then you can display it at the library and have your own little art um, gallery. Um, the paper quills, this one was a shamrock, but think about doing other, you know, designs that you want to do, but paper quilling. And then this one was from Painter Public Library, which is in Alton, and they have partnered with the Nature Institute to do their story walk. And so they'll switch those out. But again, like Lindsay said, you're meeting families, maybe families that don't always come to the library, but they're ones that like to go on family hikes or anything like that. You're meeting them where they are. And then they're like, oh, wait, this is really neat. Um, but yeah, partnering with the Nature Institute, our local trails, anything like that getting them out and COVID made this so important and it kind of brought it to the forefront of really getting more involved out, outdoors. You have the fresh air, you can space away from people. So really utilizing those outside resources. Um, it helps mental health, physical health, um, all of it. So yes, think about what, who you can partner with to, and what events you can do to have people be outside. All right, so make your collection bright, cheerful, and inclusive. So there's a variety of ways using kits to do this. Um, memory kits, sensory backpacks, um, a hiking kit, which if you're, uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources also will provide some of this stuff. Um, mental health, mindfulness, nutrition. Um, I know with COVID, not everybody's ready to do these things. Um, again, your comfort level, but putting these, these together and advertising um, to go along with your theme. And these are great for non, non summer reading times um, to get people in and realizing that the library is not just a place for books. So, mm -hmm. and then make it fun. So, miscellaneous is like a seed library. Think about other things that you can add to your collection that you don't already have, but just making it, um, you know, like Lindsay said, the one thing that we have is the fishing poles and tackle boxes and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, they come and they maintain our fishing poles and they do that for free. So um, different things that you can add to your collection. We have a telescope, we have um, binoculars for birding, um, we have Fitbits, um, but the sensory backpack. So if you have a kiddo that going places can sometimes be a challenge, the sensory backpack will have noise canceling headphones and sunglasses and uh, different like note cards that have emotions on it that make them, if it's hard for them to verbalize how they're feeling. But um, think about those different kits and miscellaneous fun things that you can have at your library that you will then be able to incorporate with your summer reading program. Okay. More collections. Yeah. 
They looks like Ashley pulled a lot of books that just have a lot of color on the cover, which I love. <laughs> so <laughs> um, these are great. They they go right along with the theme. Um, obviously, the day the crayons quit is literally in the theme uh, for yes. this year's summer reading. Um, so looking at what you have, what will create a bright and colorful display for when your patrons walk in, um, but also goes along with that theme, both in like the art aspect, but also um, maybe even when it comes to, I know we're going to get to adults, like finding out more about who you are um, as a person or your, um, your lineage. Those are great ways to um, highlight those kind of collections as well. And they feed into the theme. I know space is another um, aspect people have been focusing on during this theme. Mm-hmm. And like dual purpose too. So it's colorful and it's bright and it gets people's attention, but like eat more colors, I would venture mm-hmm. to say is having a healthier diet. And then um, in the next one, there's George and um, this, this book is great, but there's other aspects too about mental health and being inclusive. And so not only is it bright and eye-catching, but then some of them will go to um, like a beautiful oops. I mean, it's okay to mess up, you know, so just having, um, bright, colorful books, but also can have a dual purpose as well. And then also think about inclusivity and, um, there's a lot of bilingual books too, some books in Spanish, some bilingual, but if you have a large French population or, or, um, Polish or whatever, um, community members you have, think about incorporating some of those books in with your collection that you can promote during the summer reading program. And then for adults, the day the crayons quit is um, the theme, but then they also have a workbook that goes along with it and they have one in Spanish. So think about another, um, you know, the adult side of it, the art of being normal and art therapy and all these different beautiful, bright books that you can have in your collection, but again, are dual purpose and educational. And then my main point for this was <laughs> the Arthur, Arthur authors, oh my goodness, and illustrators. So Oliver Jeffers has a Facebook page and he's very active on it and Instagram. And so he hosts these like coffee dates and he'll do story times on his page. So again, um, if stats is not a concern of yours, but you want to share what these people are doing on their pages, by all means do that. But that was the main point I was trying to get with authors and illustrators is a lot of them do have active social media pages. And if they're already offering the story times or drawing workshops or writing workshops, um, don't hesitate to share what they're doing too. Um, The link that I have is a list of authors. It's just um, everyday reading. I think it's a blog, but they have a list of hyperlinked um, authors that are doing things. And again, whether it's doodles or story times or anything. So more that you can research after this. Okay. (laughs) All right. So again, more things that you can provide um, for your families are podcasts. These are um, such a way of the future. Uh, So there's a variety that we've um, highlighted here. You can suggest those to your families. You know, this is much like offering um, a list of suggested books for the summer reading theme. We're just current with the times. So you can check these out and Ashley's got a list down or some links down at the bottom too with more ideas for podcasts for kids and families. Mm -hmm. Did it go? Was that the next one? And more of them. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Some are duplicated, I think on accident, but Julie's library, that's a newer one. And oh my gosh. Um, But yeah, more podcasts. And then apps. So podcasts is one way, apps is another. And if there are a bunch of free apps out there, um, by all means, don't hesitate to, you know, involve them, incorporate them with any of your activities. And so um, we have two pages here. So there's learning apps, fitness, and they might be... Oh, yeah, there's more. So more online resources, but, and I'll go back to it, but then you can yeah. see other free apps too. So like outdoor activities, hiking, geocaching. So really just getting people outside. But then I'll let Lindsay talk about this yeah. one. Um, and so again, don't shamelessly plug your resources, right? Yes. You pay for these. So encourage your patrons to use them. Um, if you, I'm going to skip from Cloud Library to Tumble Books. Tumble Books 
if you pay for this, they send you a monthly newsletter with like, it's national um, shake your hands day and they'll give you a suggested book to read. So you can take it upon yourself to look at what books are on Tumble Books, give them, post it on your Facebook, on your Instagram and encourage people to go to your Tumble Books and listen to the story. Same thing with Cloud Library, create a list of titles that go along with our theme that are available on Cloud Library. Creative Bug, if you haven't used that one, um, there are thousands of videos on how to make things. Anything from leather making to cake decorating, knitting, there's kids stuff on there, they're great. Um, Overdrive and Libby, obviously same thing with like Cloud Library, a list of books available, Hoopla, um, and again, Ancestry, encouraging people to find out more about themselves. So I'm sure there's more that I've missed, um, but encourage your patrons to use these resources. Um, they're not cheap, so. I, right but always make sure that you're including how to utilize them. If they're gonna need a library card, um, give them the links to your website or wherever it is they need to go to make it as user-friendly. They don't wanna have to work, right? We're, we're in the age of things immediately. So put all yes. that information in your Facebook post or in your newsletter so that it's as quick and easy as possible. And the sooner they can get to it, the more likely they are to use it. Mm -hmm. True, so true. <laughs> And then references for librarians, references for librarians, right? We all need that extra help, that extra support, um, ways that get us inspired. So here are links of ways to get ideas. I read program and resource guide, the Association for um, Library Service to Children, YALSA. So NNLM, the National Network of Library for Medicine, they, I believe, partner with another library um, summer reading program, but they offer lists of ideas and um, like a list of reading recommendations as well. So um, just having that as um, ways that you can incorporate health and wellness in with your library program, that's something that you can consider too. Libraries that's a website designated for making your library more inclusive and sensory friendly. Um, they have wonderful resources. Digital marketing techniques to drive registrations and encouragement or engagement. That is from Zubin and Beanstack, if that's the platform that you, you decide to use. And then again, that TechSoup um, resource. So before you purchase anything, just double check with TechSoup because they do have a lot of discounts for a lot of things. I'll let Lindsay talk about like and follow. So, social media. Um, if yes. you're anything like me, you're on your phone. And um, as I'm scrolling, I'm seeing things that are great. So if you follow these groups on your on your Facebook, on your Instagram, then it's gonna come right into your right in your news feed. It makes things easier. Again, harder, not smarter. Smarter, not harder. I mean, yes. sometimes it makes it harder. <laughs> Um, so I read has an active social media let's move in libraries that one's great for ways to incorporate um, exercise and health. Um, library think tank tiny libraries I mean there's all Ashley's got them all on there and there's probably more that you're already a part of. Um, the other thing too is like other libraries um, i'm gonna tell you right now if you're in our area, I follow you and I stalk you okay and I <laughs> put those things aside and wait later, so that i'm not doing it at the same time, but yes we're we're a lot like teachers and i'm sure there are other former educators out there um like myself and we borrow right we're not stealing ideas we're borrowing ideas and we're all working together um my biggest thing is if you're going to do it though i try and wait you know give it some time don't do it the exact same time as your neighboring library because we don't want to necessarily compete with them we're trying to all be successful here um and again follow them on multiple platforms facebook youtube instagram um I find a lot of things for, I'll get, I said I coach gymnastics. I get a lot of gymnastics stuff on Instagram, but I get more library stuff on Facebook. That's just the experience I've had. You might have a different one. So follow what works for you, but follow that stuff, get in a group um, and, you know, save it. They have that save feature. You can use it too and create all sorts of lists. It's, oh, it's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. But I even put Pinterest, I read has a Pinterest page and uh, so many different library groups or even just librarians that are super creative have made Facebook um, Pinterest pages, but um, I even have been following some Pinterest pages just for different displays that we can do possibilities are endless the resources are there so 
we just put these out there just to make sure that you know that they're there and feel free to utilize them. That's why they're there. And again, we're in a wonderful sharing community. So like Lindsay said, that's what we do. We share, we care, we want what's best for our community and our staff, everyone. And so with that, there's podcast for librarians and I'll change the color of that so it's more visible, but um, there's links in there that will have different lists of podcasts for librarians, which is wonderful. I wanna say that library figures is kind of a marketing one. Um, some are, you know, uh, um, opinions or just factual. It all just all depends, but the resources are there for you. So have fun with them. And unless Lindsay has anything else, I am you have one to. thing because so we've been doing a lot of talking, and I <laughs> feel like you and oh, me. What? No, we <laughs> never shut up. So, I, well, but my thing with road going is there's a lot of information here and I don't for a second want anyone to think that Ashley or I do everything that we just presented on um, because it's a lot. Yes. And so yeah. please, please, please don't walk away from this feeling overwhelmed, discouraged, um, stressed. These are just ideas. So even if you walk away saying, you know what, I really liked this one idea and we're going to implement it. That's great. We've done our job. Um, but it can, these kind of things can become very overwhelming. So just take a second and think about again, what's good for you, for your staff and for your community. Um, and if you start small, start with one idea this year and add on, you know, every year here, we get a little better, we get a little more. Yes. Um, and so we just don't, I don't want you to walk away feeling like, holy cow, I could never do that because we don't do it. Um, I know someone asked about the seed library. I don't do a seed library. Um, it's just an idea. So some of these things were things we found, we thought were interesting, but we are by no means experts on them. So mm -hmm. you got this and own it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it's awesome. almost like you've provided us with an additional resource guide. I mean, what you've provided <laughs> us with is incredibly rich. Um, there are a couple comments. Um, Terry Rankin um, has asked or has suggested that School Library Journal has a number of podcasts that they mm. recommend as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I haven't checked recently, but I believe that um, School Library Journal still might be available at no cost because they were doing that through the pandemic. So you can look at their digital um, version online. And then, Amy, you asked about the slides and the recording be available. Yep, we're going to post it in a number of sites. So that's not a problem. Someone else wanted to know more about a seed library. Mm -hmm. And would anybody like to contribute to that, even those, even those of you who are on the chat? And Terry Rankin said Hornbook is available at no cost, as well as book page. Nice. We are looking at starting a seed library. So we would be um, putting, like we will would reuse our old card catalog boxes and then we would put seed packets in them. Um, let's see, are you guys seeing me right now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing myself, <laughs> just making sure. So um, we would reuse the card catalog and then we would put seed packets in there. And so we, um, are in the planning phase of it, but reaching out to your local farmers and some of your pop, your pop-up markets, um, a lot of them are willing to give seeds and donate seeds. And so you can start a seed library that way. We also have a farmer's market. Um, so I'm in our local rotary club and another rotary <laughs> member owns a farmer's market. And so he has offered to donate seeds. So I think you could start a seed library fairly easily and reasonably as far as how much money. And again, it's just those partnerships and getting, getting those community members involved. And a lot of them don't even think about it. And then when you bring that idea to them, they're like, that's a wonderful idea. Of course, we would love to help. So um, I don't expect your community members to know what you need or to know what your plans are. Um, know what your goals are. And so reaching out to them and letting them know that a lot of them are like, well, of course, or, oh, you need that. Oh, well, I know a guy or <laughs> just putting that out there. So, but that's how we plan on starting our seed library is first with our local farmers markets and our farmers and 
starting that way. And there are lots of there's lots of good information in the chat. The two I would pick out is Janelle O'Malley posted a link to the Seed Library Network. Okay. And she also suggested, and, and this is a great resource, many of our communities have master gardeners yes. that would love to get involved and contribute. I think when the you, U of I Extension Office also will offer a um, master gardener. Yes, U of I Extension is a wonderful resource for the entire state. Mm -hmm. They have numerous offices in all different counties. Um, and coverage areas. And so U of I Extension, we have partnered with them from the gardening side all the way through to a cooking demos. We did virtual cooking demos during COVID. Um, they even said they offer team groups and children's cooking groups. Um, U of I Extension is a wonderful resource from anything from the garden and nutrition all the way through. So that definitely think of them and reach out to them to partner with. And from Amy, besides fishing poles, what other items does the Illinois Department of Natural Resources offer? We have a field trip backpack. Um, I think it's for bugs. And then we have a whole kit on spiders, I believe. So one's a backpack and it's like got magnifying glasses and like a bug catcher and, and stuff like that. And then there's like a tote that I believe is spiders and insects. So we have two different things from them. But then I get confused too because I also have Lewis and Clark kit down in the basement. So um, I'll have to look. Let me go make a note. I'm going to find out what yeah. I have DNR <laughs> offers. I'm drawing a blank. And then what um, IDNR does for us is they help us with our fishing poles and yep. main, like maintaining our fishing poles every year. At least mm -hmm. once or twice a year, they come out and maintain our fishing poles. And so any goodies that we have for tackle boxes that people can take with them. I have also reached out to IDNR. We are on a wait list. So the library can start issuing hunters licenses and fishing licenses. Um, again, another service that people might not think of for libraries, but um, it's another service and resource. So um, I'm on the wait list to see if we can start getting the hunting and fishing licenses um, issued at the library. So then you're here getting your license. So here's a fishing pole and tackle box. So it's again, that whole cohesive service. So the wait list is nothing about, um, it's not like passports where like only certain people can issue passports. Um, the wait list is mainly just on their end for like the equipment. Um, so they're just waiting on the equipment, but yeah, so we're on the wait list to hopefully be able to start issuing those licenses, but that's another way you can partner with them. Um, they also do um, fishing tournaments. So if you want to reach out to them and do like a fishing derby, they'll help you host one of those too. If you partner with a local park or lake or anything like that. So, sorry, I interrupted. Well, Amy, Amy asked, and if you don't know, I'm sure someone in the chat will know, um, is can you still get a fishing license under 16 for free? Oh, I don't know. We'll watch the fish. chat. <laughs> uh, Marissa talked about 4-H as a resource. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Carissa said, you mentioned a library tour being posted and being able to count the views. Where are you posting to count the views? Um, so Facebook, you can check the views. Um, I believe that the state um, has said anything past a minute counts as like an, a, a person when you're doing attendance. Um, but my latest video that I did using closed captions for the first time, I did on YouTube. Um, and you can see the views there. So YouTube would be my, I'm going to do YouTube on my next video so that it's one, it's a one stop shop rather than Instagram, Facebook, 75 things. So. How about other questions for our presenters? Somebody did ask about in-person performers. Um, my library is not doing any in-person performers this year. We are limiting in-person programming to our kickoff party, which we're doing, we'll do in the parking lot. Um, and we normally do a Friday dance party, like year round Friday mornings, are, we call it We Jam. Um, so we're gonna do that out at the park so that we can have as much room as possible. And we opted for this program because it takes literally no prep. I plug in a bubble machine and in my, I plug in the music and we dance. So for us, that's a simple program to start outside. And if it rains, we'll just cancel. But in terms of performers, my library is not doing anything in person. 
I'm going to see if I can share my screen. This gives you an example of what we put together last year for our summer reading. So we will do like a weekly calendar, depending on like what the theme is. And so like week one was archaeology. So last year was dig deeper. So week one, we featured archaeology and paleontology, but then we broke down like a daily, like moving on Mondays, take and make Tuesdays, but all of the blue is hyperlinked that will take them somewhere else. So if it's a podcast we're featuring, if it's um, a virtual um, tour or um, nature cam, um, we partnered with a local writing group to do journal prompts that they could include. So with our summer reading program, uh, when you start, you get a folder, you get a notebook, um, and then any other helpful handouts. But this was an example of a schedule that we put together last year for our summer reading. And then this year we switched it up a little bit. So um, like the days might be a little different, but, um, but that's an example of some of our <laughs> weekly planners. But then it's good too, if people participate virtually, because then they can just click on the links and go to the different um, activities from home. But then, um, also a good way to feature your sponsors. So when I scroll down, each week has a weekly partner that we highlight. So, and then we also have different scout badges that you can earn for, for each week's theme or whatever. So uh, I think it's over the top for our size of a library, but <laughs> this is what happens when you have social workers and educators and librarians all working together and we, we can't stop. So, <laughs> so anyway, we, that's an example of our together, schedule. We do a, um, a trifold, like a pamphlet for yes. information to start with. So I already have mine done because I have um, uh, photos with the Easter bunny coming up. Um, yes. Park and Rec is doing it. So I will be there handing out crafts and I have all that information ready. So it tells them what the goal is for each age, when our kickoff party is, um, some of our year round reading challenges like thousand books before kindergarten. And this year we're doing a read the rainbow. Uh, it also will have Wee Jam on there. So just different things that they should know that's happening during the summer. Our search to city scavenger hunt. So it'll all be in one nice little piece of paper I can hand out and we can print and have at the front desk as well. So it's concise for the first few months um, leading up to it. So, because yes, I already have started. <laughs> Would anybody else like to share marketing ideas? Lindsay, what, what is Read the Rainbow? Um, read the Rainbow is a year-long reading challenge, um, and we are encouraging our patrons to read a book. Each book should either have a color in the title or um, a color as the main color on the cover. So um, we created like a book list for patrons, and we use it through Beanstack. You could do it on paper, real simple, and they just type in the title, then they earn their like brown badge. Um, and when they finish, they get, we do quarterly prizes for our year long reading challenge. It's usually like a $10 gift card um, for like Domino's or Subway. Um, and then because Amazon, I was talking about Amazon earlier, they usually sell um, Kindles for like 50 bucks. We do that as like a grand prize. So anyone who finishes the uh, Read the Rainbow Challenge gets entered to win the Kindle Fire. We also use that as our grand prize at the end of summer reading for anyone who finishes to try and boost. Um, participation, participation. So um, Jenna, I can send that to you if you want, um, like what we have specifically, but it's real simple. Last year we did 12 and 12. So we had like read a book about a murder, read a book with five words in the title, um, read a nonfiction book, read a graphic novel. So we kind of just encourage people to step out of their comfort zone. And was that for children and adults? Um, no, we do this for teens and adults. We have a thousand books before kindergarten. Uh, we've done a winter reading challenge as well. I think a lot of us have done those. Um, yeah, we did a graphic novel reading challenge back in the fall for all ages as well. Someone asked what kind of programs um, the participants are excited about offering this summer. So if anybody has any, any programs that they're doing that are new for them, that are different, that are exciting, please type it in the chat. We'd, we'd love to see. And yes, I will email our calendar from last year. I'll show you what we're thinking about for this year. It's literally just our planning document that I've used with my staff. So I don't think I, we mentioned this, but we always try to like incorporate things with awareness days or like, you know, awareness months or anything like that. 
So this is our planning document. So everything's a rough draft, but we're looking at doing nine weeks long just to keep kids engaged over the, but a lot of them are passive, but so um, May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. So as soon as we sign up, we'll do something featuring mental health. Um, let's see, in June, June 5th is National Trails Day. So we are incorporate that. So the second week we're gonna feature recreation. The third week we'll feature our gardening because it's National Gardening Week. Um, we'll talk about neurodiversity because neuro neurodiversity Pride Day is June 18th. The fifth week we're gonna highlight Pride and LGBTQ. The sixth week we'll talk about nature and outdoors because it's National Great Outdoors Month. Week seven is art because um, June is or July is World Watercolor Month. Um, our week eight we're going to feature food and nutrition because it's Culinary Arts Month, Grilling Month, and Picnic Month. And then <laughs> um, week the ninth week we're going to highlight wildlife because um, that week in July is National Zookeeper Week. So. <laughs> We literally just like find out what awareness events are going on. We can incorporate that with our weekly themes. You don't have to do weekly themes. And what I will preface with this is make sure to like cut it off when it's for you, because you can, again, go down a rabbit hole. You have to make sure that you are spending your time wisely and like we can work on this all the time, but what's the reality of it? If you break that down on a per person basis, like I don't want to be spending $20 per person to participate in a program when you incorporate works, time, materials, like all of that. So just be cognizant of um, your time, your staff's time. You could spend this all day, but anyway, this is our planning document, but yes, I am happy to send um, anything and everything out. Um, just look at what's going on that week. You could even do locally, um, for example, and we could do this too, but in Collinsville, the first weekend in June is the Horseradish Festival. So if I wanna incorporate the Horseradish Festival that week of our summer reading program, then I will. But just think about what, we, what you do locally too and incorporate it. And Ashley and Lindsay, if you don't mind, I would suggest anything that you've been asked to share. Mm -hmm. If you send it to me, we can put it on um, the event description for this, this webinar on L2, and then people will have a one-stop shop. Sounds great. Donna said they're doing reading groups based on overall goals rather than age. So read to me is 50 books, casual readers is 25 hours, and avid readers is 50 hours. So participants can choose where they wanna be. I love that. I like the phrase read to me, because we've been talking about that, you know, there are, especially in a K, like we do kindergarten to fifth grade, and that can be a really large, um, like a wide range of yeah. readers. So, you know, a fifth grader is reading a novel, while a kindergartner is probably reading a picture book and may or may not be reading by themselves yet. So if you give them a number of books, what's appropriate? And do you then split it apart which starts to become really overwhelming with a lot of sub smaller groups. So I like that phrasing of read to me and casual readers. Like those are great for, and self, I don't say self-diagnosing, but self-placing what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for all your comments and um, <laughs> your um, compliments, comments and compliments. I appreciate that. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Lori says her categories are birth to kindergarten, first through third, and fourth through fifth. Jennifer, you're not stealing, you're borrowing it. Yep. Yes, I'm giving borrow. it. I'm giving it. So. <laughs> any before we let before we let our experts go, any questions? Any more questions for them? Or any questions for the group? I'm sure among, we had, we had 160 participants. So I'm sure among this 160 people, um, we have a lot of wisdom. Well, if there's no more Ashley and Linda, 
Lindsay, <laughs> Lindsay <laughs> my brain. where's my brain um, from from all 160 of us. Thank you so very much for sharing your expertise. Um, full disclosure, this was their offer to do this for us. Um, they came to us and said, can we help? And I think that's pretty reflective of the library community as a whole. Um, all of you have stepped up so incredibly over the last 12 months and it hasn't been easy and you've all done it. So with that, we can thank Ashley and Lindsay again and wish everybody a wonderful summer reading program. Let us know, let us know how are you doing? Um, we'd love to see pictures yes. and all that kind of stuff. Um, as, and I speak for the library systems, both Rails and IHLS, as well as ILA. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not, pictures speak volumes. So share your pictures on social yes. media with, with your communities and with us. Mm -hmm. So thank you, ladies. Um, go take a breath now. We really appreciate <laughs> all you've done for us. Thank you thank guys you so much. much. Yes. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks again. Bye, guys.